from Washington, D.C., the swamp itself. This is the week's worst with Vadim and filling in for Alan, Mike Watson. I'm Matthew Vadim, Senior Vice President at Capital Research Center and Editor-in-Chief of BombThrowers.com. And I'm Michael Watson, Research Analyst at the Capital Research Center. And I'm Jake Klein, media producer at the Capital Research Center, and I'll be moderating this podcast in which we dig through the news for stories that we think are the most outrageous, the most ridiculous, the worst. On September 5th, the Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced the Trump administration was rescinding the Obama-era immigration policy known as DACA, or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Established in June of 2012, DACA allows uh, certain illegal immigrants who entered the country as minors to receive a renewable two-year period of deferred action from deportation and eligibility for a work permit. Approximately 800,000 such people, referred to as DREAMers, were enrolled in the program as of 2017. Implementation of the administration's policy will be suspended for six months, with the idea being it will give Congress time to pass a law filling the role of DACA for those protected by it. So, Matthew, these are people who came to America's children, and many have no connection to their nation of birth. 80% of DREAMers arrived when they were 10 or younger. Uh, They are not responsible for the sins of their parents, obviously. Isn't it cruel to tell them we might kick them out? Yes, I suppose it could be, but that doesn't mean it's a good. Uh, it's not a good idea. Um, the main problem with DACA is that it is an amnesty-like program that was instituted by the previous president of the United States, Barack Obama, by himself, and he is not allowed to do that. He can't do that by executive fiat. So he might have had good intentions, but he went about it the wrong way. Congress makes or is supposed to make the laws in this country, and they weren't given an opportunity to. Um, They would not, if I were king, (laughs) if I were president, which would never happen, obviously, but uh, they wouldn't have been my first priority for removal from the country. That said, the creation of DACA it was such um, an abomination, such an affront uh, to the Constitution that uh, it, it eventually it had to be it has to be expunged um, uh, from the laws, and I use that word laws advisedly in this case uh, uh, of the United States. Um, these. What's interesting is the uh, mystique that the left and uh, rhinos and big business created around these people, calling them the dreamers, as if they were all a bunch of of talented um, uh, virtuosi that had just been, you know, shipped in from the Soviet Union, like like we used to experience in the '70s and the '80s unbelievably talented and so on. Some are, no doubt, and perhaps they should not be the highest priority for removal. Maybe something could be done to allow them to stay on humanitarian and compassionate grounds. But just because these people are called dreamers doesn't mean that they're all super talented and that they've all adjusted well uh, to living in America. The question here is a question of following the Constitution. Now Congress, in its wisdom, if it wishes to um, uh, concretize this program, it it can do so because uh, it's been given a six-month window by by President Trump. So those are my initial thoughts on this. Uh, I I I have a couple of responses to that. I think the... Clearly, the DACA and the related, more egregious program that uh, former President Obama tried to enact for the parents of DACA recipients and the parents of young uh, natural-born U.S. citizens, uh, the DAPA, Deferred Action for Parents of Americans in the Washington acronym, uh, 
were extremely legally questionable. Uh, DAPA was enjoined by the, I believe it was the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, in Texas in response to a a lawsuit by numerous states uh, as being beyond the president's powers. DACA hadn't got that far, although numerous, uh, numerous states, led by Texas again, uh, had intervened to try to get it stopped by the federal courts. Uh, however, the president does have the power of prosecutorial discretion. Uh, federal law enforcement priorities are ultimately set by the president through the Department of Justice and through uh, the Department of Homeland Security as it applies to the uh, Customs and Border Protection. Uh, and the president and the cabinet members set the enforcement priorities. Uh, Now, as a matter of policy, if Congress were to enact something like DACA, uh, I think it should do that as quickly and expeditiously as possible. Uh, The fact is, the vast majority, so far as we know, the vast majority of DACA recipients uh, are gainfully employed, speak English, and to the extent that someone can assimilate to the United States, Uh, are doing an exceptionally good job of doing so. Uh, Unfortunately, the only uh, study I know of that has been commissioned was commissioned by a couple of liberal liberal organizations. They found that over, you know, over 90% uh, were were gainfully employed. Uh, You know, maybe shave a couple points on either end because of the ideological bias of where that's coming from. But it still looks like the vast majority of these people are contributing to society Uh, and are the kind of people that we would want uh, to immigrate to the United States. Uh, Now, constitutional questions are are of the utmost importance, Uh, you know, so I don't fault President Trump for saying that this has to be done in accordance with our our laws, in accordance with our policies. Uh, And President Trump uh, has, to his credit, uh, basically come out and said that uh, he wants a solution for uh, for the DACA uh, people who are, you know, came as children, but are now, in many cases, young adults, um, so that they will be allowed uh, to to stay in the United States and to continue continue contributing to our uh, to our country. So, to both of you, the president seems confident that Congress will be able to pass a replacement for DACA, a legislative replacement, in this six month window, but. Uh, per the Obama administration, his uh, his explanation for signing DACA was because he couldn't get the DREAM Act, which was intended to do many of the same things legislatively uh, through Congress. So wh- why is now different? And, uh, you know, because w- while the president seems optimistic and we do have this six month window for explicitly this purpose. This is still 800,000 people who have six months, some of them more if their work permits go longer, uh, to might have to leave the United States and go to a country they potentially have no connection to whatsoever uh, because they left there as, as children. So why is, why is this time different and why is it appropriate to leave these people hanging and their futures in the balance? I don't think we should be worried about leaving these people hanging. These all this faux compassion talk about keeping pe- bringing people out of the shadows. If people are breaking the law, then they should live in fear in the shadows. That's yeah. the idea. Five if year you olds break don't the, break the law. If you the break law. the law, well, but well, five year olds' parents break yeah, the law. Yeah, well, that. This also goes to another false notion, and that's that if any of these DACA uh, people were removed, that it would be punishment. It is not punishment. Uh, Deportation from the United States is carried out if one is in violation of the Immigration and Nationality Act. That is, if one has overstayed one visa. I don't think that's going visa. to. I don't yeah, think that. I don't think that kind of legal that legal parsing, while it may be accurate, is going to matter. Well, I, I when, don't think when, it's parsing. When the immigra- yeah, when the immigra- when immigration that's the straight, immigration that's and the when, straight law. That's not parsing. And, and when that's and when it. immigration and customs enforcement kick in your door and point an AR-15 in your face, 
I don't think you. I don't think you care whether it's I don't punishment think or Elian civil Gonzalez, removal. I'll, I'll I'll be a little uh, calm. Elian on this, Gonzalez but should I, have been allowed to stay. But I, no. I, I well, I, yeah, he should have. But well, but I'll, I'll be a little calmer on this. But I do have to say, I think Mike makes a point there that I'd I'd like you to respond to. I think it's um, it's very easy to say this is the law when you're not a person affected by the law. And so we have to ask questions beyond the legislative side. You know, law is not the reason we do things. And, and law is and, what's put in place to codify our ethical standards of how government should function. And if and if and if I may yeah. and and if I may add to that, you know, we are now I think now that the president has made his decision now that the president has said that this, uh, you know, the executive memo is now rescinded. Uh, we're going, you know, the program is going to be phased out. Congress, please do something about this. We're now talking about what the law should be, not just what the law is. Um, so okay. So anyway, the, I don't think that Congress is actually going to fix this. I think this will be thrown back in President Trump's lamp. There's no uh, uh, lap. Um, there's been no Obamacare repeal. There's been no tax reform yet. There's been no immigration reform yet. There is a do-nothing Congress. These Republicans are afraid and of President their own Trump tails. Has already, and President Trump has already made clear with the latest debt ceiling that he will work with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer as far as he needs to work. And I believe he would do so in this case. Well, goody for you. But that doesn't mean that it's going to happen. Uh, and this is an, an issue that um, uh, uh, that Americans feel viscerally about. Yes, they feel very viscerally that the DACA recipients should stay no, by polling. No, by don't. polling, no, polling don't. indicates it's over eighty percent. Push polls. No, don't. I mean, I mean don't you can yell that. push polls, fake news all well, you I'm like. I'm not yelling push but... polls. I'm saying push <laughs> polls. Uh, one at a time. Okay, uh, Matthew, were you in the middle of saying something? Did you want? I'm just add saying to that? that Congress isn't going to do anything. It's going to come back to President Trump, and ultimately he will have to decide. Uh, I imagine he will draw up, as they've done in other countries, um, some some guidelines for granting uh, humanitarian or compassionate relief. And that the most deserving will probably be al allowed to stay. As I said at the outset of this, although this is a constitutional abomination, um, uh, that doesn't mean these people should be the first to be targeted for removal. There are plenty of plenty of illegal aliens out there, plenty of big businesses and small businesses employing illegal aliens. There's not 11 million of them in the country. It's probably triple that. And uh, those should be a high; those should be higher priorities. Congress isn't going to do anything. Trump is going to have to decide, and this will drag on, and it'll likely be an issue in the um, the next presidential election as well. Okay, that, so I was just addressing the 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 uh, electoral politics aspect of it. Okay, so let's then let's for at least the moment because we got into it for a little bit. Let's strip back the legal elements. Let's strip back the uh, who should be a priority in policy. And let's just talk about these people and what at the end of the day should be uh, done uh, uh, about it. So uh, whether it's legislative, whether it's another executive action, what would each of you like to see happen when it comes to, quote, dreamers? I think what I predicted will happen is the best course of action. After Congress fails to do anything about this, as per its um, track record, uh, the administration is going to be forced to uh, is going to be forced to at uh, allow at least some of these people to stay using um, criteria that they will have to uh, adopt, uh, you know, how well they've adapted to American society, etc. Uh, and I think that is, uh, is what should be done. But, but th this in itself, though, is dangerous, because even though 
Yes, these are innocent children brought to the country in many cases by their parents illegally. Uh, they didn't do anything wrong. Everybody acknowledges that. There, the law has still been broken, and um, granting amnesties of any kind, and that's what this would be, uh, encourages further law-breaking. So I'm not saying there shouldn't be a little bit of an amnesty here, but, you know, you get on a slippery slope uh, and you start encouraging these things, and then people expect it. More people cross the border illegally or overstay their visas, and the cycle continues anew. Uh I am less pessimistic than uh, Matthew that Congress will do nothing. Uh, what I would say that I am pessimistic about uh, is the possibility that because uh, President Trump has decided to take out a vendetta against the Republican leadership, that the chances for any sort of comprehensive deal will be will be broken. And that instead what we'll see is either a temporary or permanent extension of uh, the old DREAM Act or the DACA, but codified into a law, uh, with no uh, movement on border security or employ uh, employer enforcement or visa enforcement uh, to curtail uh, future illegal migration. Um, Right now, we the uh, the rate of illegal migration has dropped substantially uh, because of in, President in, Trump. And I was about to give him credit for that. Good. The Trump administration's willingness to enforce the law uh, in the broad scale has caused economic migrants to think, you know, maybe this isn't going to work. A deal that codified some of that enforcement and made it a bit sti made it stickier for when you know if and when the next time. Uh, the Republicans lose the president lose the presidential election uh, might keep that rate down and might give us more sp and might give us more space uh, to consider things to regularize the status of well-adjusted, employed, productive people who are not in the you know may not legally have status in this country, uh, or to decide uh, on, a, on, a, on a different note what sort of future immigration we should have. Uh, whether we should move towards a, a points-based system uh, to get more educated uh, migrants, um, as has been as has been proposed, and then uh, to determine how many of the uh, of how many of those people we should have, the more that this is left uh, in 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 limbo, uh, the more likely it is that when the Democrats inevitably retake. Uh, the presidency and the Congress, that there will be a continuation of the total non-enforcement uh, that we saw in many ways with the declaration of the DAPA that contributed significantly to the 2014 uh, the 2014 uh, Central American uh, child migrant crisis. Uh, before the show, we were talking a little bit about the idea of amnesty, and so I just wanted to comment on on that a little bit, and maybe we can have a bigger discussion about it. But uh, amnesty has been used as a buzzword in the immigration conversation for a while as a bad thing. You know, we're supposed to have a law and order system where if you break the law, there are consequences for that. But at the same time... Uh, it's not exactly a, a foreign concept that amnesty might be given to people who had a very good reason for breaking the law or were left with no choice but to break the law, such as children brought a, across the border by their parents. And I also find it interesting um, because the presidential pardon is, of course, a form of amnesty. And I find it interesting that I think a lot of the people who would have supported the president's pardon of Joe Arpaio are probably the same people uh, calling this amnesty in a negative sense. Uh, that was just uh, occurred to me as interesting. But Mike, Matthew brought up a, a really good point earlier, which, which you touched on. Um, but one of the reasons Sessions gave for ending DACA was that it was a leading cause behind the surge in 
unaccompanied minors coming to the United States from Central America. And data shows illegal immigration is weighed down since Trump took office, uh, you know, widely credited to his policy stances and rhetoric on, you know, if, if you come here, you're going to get deported. Um, so while dealing with the illegal immigrants who, is our, who are already here is clearly a problem we need to handle, isn't this sort of tough policy necessary to prevent people from illegally immigrating to begin with? Well, the question is what sort of tough policy? And I don't think that kicking in doors and demanding papers, please, on people who have been in this country for 10, 15 years, gainfully employed, contributing to this country, is the policy that we need. The policy that we need is enforcement at the border and enforcement of visas, uh, both of which the Trump administration has shown quite a bit of interest in doing. Uh, if the Trump administration were more willing to work with the Republican leadership in Congress, I think there would be a good chance of some sort of exchange uh, of leniency, of amnesty for this population of illegal immigrants uh, in exchange for perhaps you verify, perhaps funding for border fortification, perhaps uh, mandatory exit checks. Uh, you know, I just got back. I just got back from a trip to Europe, and when you leave, when you enter Europe, obviously you get your passport stamped. You also get stamped when you leave, so that the European uh, the European border agents know how long you were here. You only have ninety. You know, as a visitor, you only have ninety days. After your ninety days, you're supposed to go. Uh, the United States does not do that kind of check. I'm not necessarily saying we should, but there's a reason that half of, or an estimated half of the illegal immigrant population right now are people who have overstayed legitimate entries into the United States. And there's very little being done to, to address that. Unfortunately, again, I am, I am concerned that I think what you may see is a clean, quote unquote, we use in the, the Washington lingo, you know, unamended uh, passage of DACA into law. And there, I think it is a legitimate, a legitimate worry, although given the rest of the Trump administration's immigration enforcement policy, I don't necessarily believe it would come to pass that that may uh, lead to some uh, to some misinterpretation and, uh, and illegal migration based on, on misinterpretation. Uh, Matthew, um, so another thing that Sessions brought up uh, during his press conference announcing this policy uh, was that— And by uh, Sessions, you mean Attorney General Def Jeff Sessions. Yes, yes, I do. Um, yeah. So he said that DACA eligible individuals were lawbreakers who adversely impacted the wages and employment of native born Americans. And so underlying all of the conversation about illegal immigration is the idea that we should have immigration laws and border controls because there is some reason that people shouldn't be here. Um, and it seems like one of the biggest reasons given is economic, that somehow it hurts um, American workers. Um, so number one in Sessions comments, uh, how is it appropriate to call children lawbreakers? But number two, adverse impact on wages uh, is something that nearly all economists say is not really happening in that immigration is a clear net policy for our economy. So if we should be concerned about immigration from an economic perspective, why? Well, we already address, address the question of um, um, children as, as lawbreakers and the way the law is written up, yes, they are breaking the law. They don't have to have mens rea. It doesn't matter. But the other question you raise is if allowing endless waves of migrants to the country is good for the economy. Well, um, if we had massive labor shortages, which we don't, 
Uh, we have a lot of people who have given up on finding work and they've taken themselves out of the workforce. So the unemployment figures that you get from the Department of, is it labor or commerce? I forget. Uh, don't truly represent the state of the, the workforce or of, of the pool of prospective employees out there. Um, I don't think that it is universally agreed by economists that immigration is always a good thing for the economy. Thomas Sowell, a uh, respected conservative economist at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, um, said it's roughly a wash. You know, the people come in, they get a, a, absorbed into the economy, and you know, there's there's no net benefit. Uh, there might be a net cost, but, but, you know, it depends. As economists like to say, it depends. They really dislike giving straight answers much of the time. So I don't think that this boosterism for endless waves of migration uh, is helpful. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's indifferent. But um, I, I think if you look at individual sectors, you can look at the construction industry where wages have been decimated and uh, people who, were, who had good paying jobs have been pushed onto the unemployment rolls because illegal aliens have taken their positions. I think you have had a, there's been a significant impact in specific sectors, regardless of what the overall numbers may say. So it's a question of what you want to, who you want to protect and, and what your priorities are. I mean, I think that the consensus in general favor of immigration is a lot broader uh, by, among economists is a lot broader than Matthew uh, is, is implying here. Um, just, most generally, the the larger your population is, the more people you have, uh, you're able to generate more wealth because people are the, the the great insight of economics in the industrial age is that people are an asset, not a cost. Uh, if if pe- they're productive, well, and most immigrants, and there's an and, assumption and, and, that immigrants and, are and always mo- productive. Well, which and is most wrong. Im- and most immigrants are most immigrants are productive. Oh, most Im- most, so. immig- most immigrants are coming here to work. You know, it, it's the it's the classic. Or to of, send remittances it, back to Mexico. And where do they get the money? They get the money from a job. They go to work. Now you can say, oh, you're you know you're draining our precious bodily fluids, but no, the and the the fact is, they they made that money by working at jobs, and then you know, I mean, I believe in the free market. I believe that once I make money at a job, I should be able to use my money for whatever I feel you know whatever I feel like within very basic bounds of legality. You know, so if I want to send that to my family abroad, that's perfectly legitimate. Um, but no, the 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 economic consensus uh, in favor of of immigration is very strong. And the only time that you see identifiable uh, impacts on wages are when you have extremely high levels of immigration. Fifty percent of the population increases, and in, in a subset population increases in a matter of two years. Uh, and even that that rough finding uh, on the Mariel boat lift uh, by George Borjas is hotly contested. It is not it is not widely accepted in the economics literature. Um, so, you know, no, I I don't believe that there is a substantial economic cost uh, that we are bearing here. And uh, the fact is, enforcement itself, uh, every act of enforcement is an, ec- is an economic cost. We have to pay government, government agents uh, to carry weapons uh, because people don't want to go, people don't want to go voluntarily. They, they want to stay. Uh, you need government agents with weapons to go into people's houses to demand to see papers. They don't do that for free and they aren't equipped for free. So the question, so the, the question, part of the question of amnesty is, are those costs that we want to bear? And I think that we have shown by our actions over the past 30 years that we do not want to bear those costs. We are not willing to bear those costs. So, I think President Trump is not willing to bear those costs quite sensibly. Something that's disturbed me, and I think a lot of this has been put out there into the public discourse by my friend or 
I'm not sure if he's still my friend in recent years, but he's a good guy as a person. Alex Narasta, the uh, immigration policy expert at the Cato Institute, who used to come to my taco nights at the press club, but <laughs> now looks at me, you know, you know, with a sideways glance. But anyway, these things happen. Um, he and a lot of these other pie-in-the-sky libertarians, and I consider myself a libertarian, but not 100%, they have Nazified the language of immigration enforcement. Okay, ICE, this is really insulting that ICE uh, officers are compared to the Gestapo or the SS. I did not. I, I will. You I will. I will. I'm going kicking to, in doors oh, and yes, demanding yes, papers. And when, and when you execute a search warrant, you kick in a door. You can and when kick you, in a door. It is you, not okay, required. Okay, yes, it is. It is right. not. Usually, not every... they knock and say hello, immigration here, or police. I'm just saying that there's this contempt for the act of enforcing the law. If people break the law and they they won't come in, they won't surrender voluntarily. You have to go get them. I'm just making that point, and there is this tendency to try to make the police uh, and immigration agencies the bad guys, and I find that, that really disturbing, and it really clouds the issue. Well, I don't, I don't think it clouds the issue. I think it is the issue. Because if the level of force necessary, and yes, I may, I may have used the most maximum amount of force that our laws currently allow the police to use in my example, but I mean... It was written up in the in the uh, Weekly Standard a couple weeks ago. Uh, they did a ride along with Immigration and Customs Enforcement in Southern California, and I encourage everyone listening to go read that article at the Weekly Standard uh, and to see the amount. So that and that is the normal amount of force. Now, I don't think that's necessarily unreasonable. Why? Because of who they're targeting. They're targeting people who have been credibly accused of crimes, people who have been uh, you know, involved in the justice system, you know, those are the people that I think it is perfectly legitimate for the United States to say, no, you can't be here, you have to go home. When you're talking about gainfully employed 24-year-olds who came when they're five, is that the amount of force that we should use? Is that, and, and again, I, I think that that's the core of the issue. The core of the issue with immigration is we need an immigration law that we are willing to enforce. And Right now, we have a very harsh law on the books that we are not willing to enforce, and the result is that we effectively don't enforce the law at all. I, I didn't read that article, but you've drawn our attention to it, and now I want to. But you, what, what examples of the use of force, what best practices were, were, were reported in that article? You, you, you just you didn't, you didn't go into any detail. Could you give a few details? So... Sure. They went, to, they identify who they're going to go after on that, on a, on a given day. Uh, again, in accordance with the administration's priorities, they go after people who have been involved in the justice system, people who have been accused of, you know, who've been accused of other, other offenses. No, but the, the, the force, the for, use of force. I think Matthew's I'm, asking about, maybe were I they was literally unclear. kicking down doors? Do they well, kick what in they doors? Do? No, they were, they were, they were surveilling houses. They were, they were... Serve, they were serving search warrants, not necessarily by kicking in doors. Again, that was an extreme example. Uh, but again, in one case, they found, you know, one of their targets wasn't there, but they found his they found his dad who hadn't done anything wrong other than be illegally present in the United States, and so they took him in. You know, all these people were were placed under arrest. They were placed in handcuffs. They were taken to the police station. Is that is that what we you know for people who aren't aren't criminals and aren't necessarily a burden on our society. Is that, is that what we want to do? I want to go back to the economic question for a second, because I, I, I do feel like this whole conversation has, uh, and I don't just mean at this table, uh, but in society broadly has been focused on, we have these laws, we have people that have broken them. What do we do? And while that's really important in a conversation that needs to be had, the more fundamental question is what laws should we have and why should we have them? Um, and I think we brought up 
uh, at least one economic fallacy in our discussion of uh, the effects of immigration, which is, Matthew, you brought up, uh, you know, we have uh, we don't have a huge employment deficit, you know, so it's not like they're coming and, and filling uh, jobs that we need filled. But but that's not really true. That's not how jobs worked. There's not a fixed number of jobs in an economy. And economies are much, much more productive when we are creating new jobs so we can be creating new goods and services, which we need additional labor to do. Um, and in our, within our domestic economy, there's also the demand side of more immigration brings more consumers for uh, American businesses. But then also just having a greater labor force that is able to create a uh, more productive economy allows us to sell more goods uh, internationally. Um, and so I, I just sort of wanted to note that I don't think the economic effects of immigration are that simple of their uh, taking Americans' jobs. They're creating a larger economy. And, and if, I could, if I could add one point to, to build on that, uh, you know, Matthew brought up the uh, widely remarked upon decline in broader labor force participation. A great deal of that decline in labor force participation has come from two things. One, the workforce is getting older, which means that people are taking retirement. And two, people are spending more time in school and therefore not being in the labor force because they're going to, they're extending their uh, undergraduate education, more people are getting an undergraduate education, uh, or they're going uh, into into graduate education uh, and therefore are not considered employed and they're not looking for work because they're in school, so they're not considered unemployed. Uh, that isn't the entirety of the uh, decline in labor participation, and we should obviously keep an eye on on uh, labor participation as an important economic indicator, but not everyone who has gotten out of the labor force uh, since the 2008 recession uh, has done so involuntarily. Uh, many have retired and many have stayed in school. Also, um, I believe you brought up Sowell, and I'm I'm not certain about this, but if 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 I recall correctly, I believe Sowell's argument for why it was a wash was because um, De a lot depending of are, he qualified it. Very yes, carefully. yes, but because a lot of immigrants uh, that are coming are very poor and taking advantage of our. Uh, welfare systems. And don't um, assimilate well to our culture, particularly Mexican people. <laughs> they don't assimilate well. well, well. well uh, in, in, in what way? I think it's been pretty well established. David Frum, uh, who is no friend of open borders, has written pretty extensively that they are resistant to assimilation uh, in the United States, more so than any other group. They by, don't. They don't learn to speak English. By and, all accounts. They, no, well, number one, how can you talk about it as they making every single Mexican immigrant a, I'm not a single class? Every, I think I'm that making, would be really offensive to a lot of Mexican no, immigrants who have. Uh, <laughs> also, people. also, I contest the, the, the. I contest your factual premise. Yeah. The, the, the. Uh, there have been surveys conducted. Based on uh, based on the historical rate of uh, English language uptake by immigrants and the current foreign-born population uh, compares favorably with past foreign-born populations uh, as far as their uptake of the English language. I I do not believe that there that the English language is in any way under threat in the United States. I didn't say it was under threat. I said that taken as a group, because. If you're doing studies of groups, you have to generalize that they don't assimilate, that the Mexican immigrants in particular don't assimilate particularly well. And uh, I'm not just making that up. You can look at David Frum's old columns when he was at uh, National Review and you can find that. You can also, um, uh, the, the idea that, Im that Immigrants are never or almost never a burden on society, uh, has been contested by Robert Rector, the welfare and social policy analyst at uh, 
the Heritage Foundation, who's put out a number of papers uh, talking about the net burden that a lot of immigrants uh, place on the American uh, taxpayer. So these things are not as clear-cut as some suggest they are. Um, l- l- let's move past the discussion. It, can I also of, bring up yeah. the Milton Friedman aphorism? And that is, and uh, I paraphrase, you can have open borders or a welfare state, but you can't have both. You have right, to make so, a decision. So let's move past the, yeah. the cultural If the U.S. is a welfare magnet, yeah. it's going to con- continue attracting uh, a lot of illegal immigration. Well, that was the point I was in the middle of making, which I believe, if I recall, maybe there were some cultural elements to it that I don't recall. It's been a while since I've uh, read Sowell on this issue, but that he found it to be a wash because... Uh, of the net cost to our economy of the welfare payments versus uh, productivity. But uh, Brian Kaplan, a libertarian economist, has addressed that complaint by saying, well, that's not a reasonable reason to say that we shouldn't have immigration, but rather the policy solution that follows from that is we need to uh, be having policies that limit the ability of low-income immigrants to take advantage of our welfare system, and that's the distinction that's that's worth well, drawing. I don't and there, think and there's, too many people are saying we should have no immigration, except maybe for Ann Coulter. I I mean, well, if 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 I may if I may interject with a worthwhile Canadian initiative, uh, a lot has been said, uh, especially with respect to the uh, the the so-called Raise Act, which was introduced by Tom Cotton and and David Perdue at an event uh, with President Trump, uh, I want to say last month, uh, maybe it was two months ago. Um, and the core of that that uh, that bill uh, gets the Canadian approach to immigration half right, uh, because it consists of two principal parts. The first would change how the United States selects which immigrants are going to be given permanent residency, are going to be given work authorization, uh, from based on family reunification to based on economic the uh, the economic productivity of the future immigrants. You're referring to the points based system. The points based system, which is a big success, as I'm I'm sure you're about to say. I, the can, the Canadian and also the Australian and New Zealander experience of immigration is extremely good. Uh, in 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 two parts. The first of which is the points based system. Uh, the second, which the Raise Act gets wrong, is that the Canadian, Australian, and New Zealander systems uh, all allow fairly high levels of, immigra- of immigration of the people that they have then passed through their points-based system, whereas the Raise Act would choke it off. Uh, the target is to reduce legal immigration by half. Uh, now, once you've decided that a, an immigrant who meets a certain series of thresholds, which is what a points-based system ultimately is, uh, I believe at that point you would have decided that this person is extremely likely to assimilate well, is extremely likely to be an economic contributor, is likely to be a net taxpayer, is likely to be uh, a financial and social contributor to the good and well-being of the nation. And at that point, once you've met that threshold, I would argue that you should let anyone who meets that threshold and wishes to migrate to the United States in. And that is, you know, the, the uh, foreign-born population of Canada is roughly double uh, as, a, as a percentage what the foreign-born population of the United States is. And that includes the estimate of illegal immigrants in the United States. Well, this was going to be my next question for the both of you, was about the RAISE Act, because one of the strategies for protract, for protecting uh, dreamers that's been uh, proposed, and I don't know how credible this is, is that Republicans might try to tie that protection to passing the RAISE Act, which is, of course, a very controversial bill for the reasons that you just laid out, Mike, uh, amongst others. So, Matthew, what would you think about that tactic being used where protecting dreamers hinges on passing the Raise Act, and also what do you think about the Raise Act broadly? You know, 
I am not up to speed on the Raise Act, uh, and I'm not exactly sure what it does. I'm sorry to inform you. So if you could just give me a little um, primer on it for 30 seconds, that would be appreciated because I don't want to comment on something I know nothing about. Well, I think Mike just Although did it, it's very popular in Washington, D.C., for pundits to comment on things they know nothing about. Do you have anything more you want to add? Uh, no, the uh, because although I know about the structure of the bill, I don't know the particular thresholds that have been uh, that have been set regarding the proposed it, points. It, the, is the, is the, the Raise Act the proposal itself to slash overall immigration rates? Yeah, it, so it, it, that is expected, that is part of it. That it, that is part of it. It's expected to reduce legal immigration by fifty percent. Okay, which is so obviously it's a massive it's the amount. Trump administration's rough blueprint um, uh, for for reforming the immigration system. Yes, although it's also been proposed in previous congressional sessions. So, yeah, it but this is but this is the mo but because it now has the the at least current support of the administration. This is the most uh, most it's been debated. Uh, well, I I think that there's nothing wrong with reducing the flow of immigrants into the United States. I don't think too many people want to cut it off entirely. America is the most generous country in the world of allowing pe in terms of allowing uh, refugees and others um, uh, to move to uh, its soil, and. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with cutting overall immigration levels, if that's what you wanted to know about. It doesn't offend me as it offends, um, you know, some people. Presumably, Lindsey Graham is offended by it. I mean, the... Like, immigration the, the, isn't a panacea, and some people seem to think it is. I mean, something can be good and not cure all the problems in a society, uh, and again, I'll restate, if the Rays Act, the point, if the points based system in the Rays Act is added to the immigration system, a lot of the problems that we have with our current immigration system, the expectation that a certain number of immigrants are, gonna, are going to be on welfare, are going to become public charges, even though there are limitations on what sort of benefits you can receive, not all of them are limited. Uh, or enforced. By, the limitations aren't enforced necessarily. By changing our immigration system from the family reunification setup to an economically based points-based system, you end up with a, a richer class of immigrants. The Raise Act itself, I think quite correctly, privileges uh, having a fluency in the English language. That takes care of that reduces the probability that you would have some sort of linguistic underclass. Uh, those, because that solves a couple of the principal theoretical problems, I don't see why you then need the 50% reduction. Uh, so now, in to go back to your original question about, you know, trading some portion of the Rays Act for DACA, you know, I would be, I would be absolutely elated if a truly Canadian style points based system were coupled with the ACA. I Sounds don't Sounds like I, a good I, idea. You mean I, with, with the D A C A? You said A C A. D A yeah, no, I, I, I Obamacare. I, no, no, not with Obamacare. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the uh, but yeah, no. Just with, checking. I always good to make sure. Uh, yeah, no, com I would I would absolutely be elated if if a Canadian style points based system truly Canadian style points based system were combined with uh, with DACA uh, being made permanent and legal. Um, Could do be I, a do good I, idea. Do, do I think that will happen? No, because everyone has the incentive just to pass the the clean DACA. Uh, and uh, given the president's uh, continuing efforts to undermine the negotiating ability of Republicans in Congress, I doubt that uh, even if they were so inclined that they would be able to. Well, I, I want to ask, is there any anyone Republicans would actually deport? Is there anyone that you would actually deport, since you think that uh, immigration enforcement agencies are jackbooted thugs? I do, I, again, you... Deportation. 
who should actually be deported? Should we let everybody who's here illegally stay? Because a lot of people talk tough, especially in the Republican conference in the House and the Senate. But is there anyone who would they they would remove from the country? I would, sincere question. Uh, obviously, people who have been convicted of or are standing charged for a criminal offense. Obviously, okay. Obama's committed to that and carried yes, it out he, to he, some extent. And he kicked, so and he kicked a lot of people out of the country. Um, <laughs> the, he he <laughs> he exag- he doctored um, deportation figures by uh, taking people who had just shown up. Uh, in the United States illegally, who were turned back, turnarounds, and, and, I think they called the, them, and included them in the deportation figures. And, and, the princi- and the principal place where immigration law should be enforced is at the border and at the port of entry. And, oh, perhaps and it the, should, but I'm just saying those figures uh, were uh, massaged a bit. I don't I, think you can rely. Obama was not the deporter-in-chief. I mean, whether that's true or not, ultimately, again, in the sense of prosecutorial discretion, I would focus on people who have committed and and are accused of crimes. And then I would focus the enforcement at the border and at the port of entry. And yeah. You wouldn't remove anybody who's overstayed their their visa. I was about to get to that. Okay. You know, I, I think we I think we need to have enforcement for visa overstays. I think people who uh, fraudulently doctor social security numbers I think that crime should be prosecuted in a way that it has historically not been. The, uh, but but no, I I am I do not believe that people who have otherwise been productive, people who have otherwise kept their nose clean, should be the tar- should be the principal primary targets for immigration removal. I, so that's basically nobody except for some criminals. I, I don't think that's what that's he said. Not, and I, I sort <laughs> of agree with Mike's perspective, although I might go a little uh, tougher. Um, given the state of current law, again, getting back into that, given the law is what it is right now, I, I do believe in law and order and that the laws on the books have to mean something. Uh, I think the priority should, of course, first be criminals um, and, uh, you know, visa overstays and productive whatever uh, illegal immigrants should be low priority. But that's only given that the law is currently what it is. I want that law changed immediately. Uh, It's not productive for our economy. It's not helpful for the American people. Um, Well, how do you want it changed? Jake? Well, I, I quite liked Gary Johnson's proposal during the uh, during the presidential campaign, which is you pass a background check, you get a work visa, you can come here. You've, becoming a citizen is still extremely difficult and comes with high burdens. But ultimately, if you can come here to work and you can be uh, productive towards our society, uh, immigration numbers can be as high as they want. I don't, I don't care as long as it's beneficial for the American people, which most economists say it is. Um, I, think, I think, I think even I'd be a little bit more, more restrictive than that. Uh, I would like to see, uh, again, similar to, but more lenient than the proposals in the Rays Act, uh, you know, uh, a a, the, a refocus of the immigration system on people who are likely to be strong contributors to our economy, uh, people with advanced degrees, people... Uh, who, so it's sort of like taking the point system idea and applying it to the whole system. Absolutely. That, that, that's the idea. Right. The, the idea is to make, uh, you know, rather than use... I mean, the point system used broadly... Uh, you know, al- allows uh, uh, allows us as a as a country to decide uh, that once these people have met the threat, have met the threshold, have met the threshold to be contributing members of our society, to be uh, relatively good candidates for integration, uh, that at that point they should be admitted. And uh, you know, if we had a system like that, I might be more willing. Uh, to to enforce internally a bit more harshly, but again, right now the system is simply broken, 
And until the system is repaired, I think a lot of people, myself included, are going to be uncomfortable using the full force of the government to enforce our broken laws. I don't know that the system is broken necessarily. Maybe I'm just being playing with semantics here, but well, it's never to, really been enforced. You so, have to, you have to call you know, it, it depends what you mean by broken, I suppose. Well, you have to call it a little bit broken when under Democratic administrations, Republican administrations, whoever it may be, you know, over many years, we now have about 11 million illegal immigrants here. Well, it's so. not broken in terms of the perspectives, um, the priorities of, of big business, particularly agribusiness, which relies heavily on illegal aliens for um, harvesting crops, so and every, um, and they, they every, like they like the fact that, that it's like, easy and every, to get and illegal And everyone who shops at an American grocery store yes. and takes advantage of the prices that they pay is profiting from that. I read that as an I wouldn't argument mind if you for paid a dime more liberalized. I wouldn't uh, mind paying a dime lesson. more a head for lettuce I, if our I, laws were well, respected. That's not a, you called yourself a libertarian mm-hmm. earlier. That's not a liber- very libertarian view. I mean, that's almost a, an argument for the minimum wage. Uh, uh, by that matter, Listen, you know, are you I willing to pay a dime more so that Americans? I'm not, not wedded to to. Why is you know, it different? I, I didn't say I'm a hundred, different country. Is it what? Why is it different that you're willing to pay a dime more because they came from a different country? But no, I imagine you no, wouldn't be for it, raising for the, law, the minimum wage to the pay law a dime more. to be enforced. If the law is enforced and it causes some effects in the economy, the larger economy, that's okay. Why? I, 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 I mean, yeah, why? why not? Like, well, because I think we have to. The value of enforcing the law and having a law and order system is insofar as it benefits the American people to have a society uh, where we live by laws and laws are respected and that pr- uh, protects uh, the American people from criminal violence and whatever other and way if it's simply, and if it's broken simply, laws may may harm people. Um, at the same the time, that has to be there? weighed. Sure. At the same time, that has to be weighed against the costs of enforcing bad laws. So we can have the conversation about which is more beneficial well, and we, which is worse for the American people. But we but can't just say law we're isn't willing to pay law. any... It might be. We, we can't just say I, 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 we're I willing think, to pay anything <laughs> at all just to keep bad laws on the books. I, 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 I would disagree that it's, you know, that it's a bad law immigration laws in general, which seems to be what you're saying, but... Well, if it's raising costs for American people, that seems like one reason to believe it might not be having beneficial effects. But you have to follow the law. But the laws should make sense. The law in this case does make sense. This aspect of it isn't broken. Well, I And if like... it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, I feel I, like that's I the think, debate. I think, we're, I think had, that is the debate. <laughs> I think that's the debate we've had over the last hour, so we will leave it to our viewers to figure yeah, it out. I don't from think there. we're going to resolve it today. <laughs> that's our show. Although for this week. we all sincerely tried. And if that, and if Congress does its job, we may be having this debate again sometime not so in the not so distant future. I, I, I suspect <laughs> this won't get resolved for many, many years. But that's our show for this week. We'll be back next week and we hope you'll join us. If you're not already, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and Stitcher and follow us on social media at Capital Research Center on Facebook and YouTube and at Capital Research on Twitter. I'm Matthew Vadum. And I'm Michael Watson. And I'm Jake Klein. Thanks for listening.